Good evening. I know that there is still some of you that is coming back from your food, but we promised our online guests that we're going to be going live at 7:10. And one thing that CareNet is very good about is being on time. My name is Margaret Cole and I am your CEO. <laughs> we are so excited to have our host homes join us tonight. Welcome. I would like to thank everyone who has made this night happen. Because of a generous donation, this event has been completely underwritten. Thank you, Crosspoint. James, you and your staff are amazing. And what a beautiful venue. I mean, look around. We have 42 tables in this room. And how splend. Best <laughs> banquet food, as always. And when we were talking, Holly and I were like, I want an upscale Thanksgiving dinner. Did we make that happen? So if you're not familiar with House Blend, they're down at 30, no, we're at 305 South Main. They're on Main Street. You cannot miss them. <laughs> Do not come to CareNet for coffee. <laughs> Thank you to all of our table hosts, volunteers, board, and staff who have worked on this event for many months. We could not do this night without you. Thank you, our online guests. Again, we're gonna include you in everything that we're doing tonight. I would like to take this time to acknowledge some very important guests that we have in attendance. If you are a preacher, a pastor, a deacon or an elder, please stand and remain standing. Thank you. Thank you for your willingness to partner with the faith community and take a stand for life. Leaders, look around. We are working together for a common cause. Thank you. You may sit down. If you are a CareNet board member, staff member, or volunteer, please stand and remain standing. I salute you. Thank you so much for changing so many lives. You may sit down. CareNet empowers individuals to make an informed choice concerning their pregnancy and sexual health. CareNet is in partnership with the Christian community to dramatically reduce the number of lives lost to or harmed by abortion. Your local CareNet opened their doors in June of 1995 and has been serving Dixon and surrounding counties for 27 years. At CareNet, we believe that life decisions need life support. And the church is God's instrument to provide life support to women, men, and families, to empower them to choose life for their unborn children and abundant life for their families. James 1.27 compels us to care for the orphans, the widows. Accordingly, God created his church 
among other things, to fight to protect the unborn, end abortion, and strengthen families. Church, we need to be proactive. How can we be proactive? By speaking love from the pulpit, love throughout the church, love throughout the community, by letting people know you and your church is a safe place and will not cast judgment on anyone who find themselves in an unplanned pregnancy. You are planting a seed. You are speaking compassion, hope, help, and discipleship to women and men faced with unplanned pregnancy decisions. At your table is something to take back to your church and implement a Making Life Disciples team. This will help your church establish a team to walk alongside women and men facing pregnancy decisions and to build a unified, holistic kingdom response to abortion. It turns your church into a central point of compassion to our community. Our theme this year, if you could not tell, is choose love. Everyone should have a sticker and a bracelet. This is something that you can choose love in so many ways. Two words that mean so much. We choose to love those who walk through our doors. One person I would like you to meet did just that, walked through CareNet's doors. I am honored to introduce my friend and fellow PA girl, y'all PA people know what I mean, yes? Go Steelers. <gasps> if you know me, you know me. <laughs> So I want you to take a moment and listen to Jeanette's story of God's healing and the power of community. Hello, everyone. Um, when Margaret asked me to speak at this um, banquet tonight, I was so honored, and I'm very happy to be here. I'm going to speak on the subject of abortion. There was a time when it was very difficult for me to talk about, but um, I'm, doing, I'm doing okay now. So, I would like to say that our abortion can be very uncomfortable and awkward to speak of in certain circumstances and with certain people. And I'd like to, to also say that anyone who's uncomfortable with this subject because of a past experience I want you to know that my words are not con condemning or judging, but understanding and full of grace. Um, and also that Karenet is here for you, and so am I. My story begins in 1973. Abortion is legal. I'm a senior in college and pregnant and not married. Um, my boyfriend and I, knew that we had a choice we could make because abortion was legal. During this time, my feelings were high. They were just full of fear, panic, relentless anxiety focused on my problem or our problem. And after much procrastination, when I was 12 weeks pregnant, we chose what we thought was the easy way out, abortion. I had no idea that it would result in so much em emotional, mental, physical, and spiritual distress. Um, a woman's choice to end her baby's life can have profound and significant consequences. Um, I can list them, guilt, shame, condemnation, remorse, regret, they're all heavy burdens as well as anxiety, depression, 
anger, self-hate, and there's destructive behaviors such as substance abuse. Let me not forget self-esteem issues, relationship issues. Some women can feel numb or some have suicidal thoughts. And then there's eating disorders too. My experience when the abortion was over, I had a great sense of relief. I thought, we'll get on with our lives now. Graduated college, we married soon after that. And after a few years, pregnant with our first child. And that's when I learned about the development of the baby in the womb. And that's pretty much when I started feeling remorse, regret, so, so heavy. It's a hard thing to deal with. Also shame. Um, I had anxiety and depression. I developed an eating disorder. So we'll fast forward through the years. Um, all those feelings, the heaviness brought me to my knees and I received salvation and redemption through Jesus. <laughs> I'm very thankful, and let me continue that the burdens were gradually removed. It was not an instant, instantaneous thing. I had a poor self-image, some self-hate, and I did mention the eating disorder. Uh, at one point, when I felt a little freer, I decided to share my story at um, pro-life events. I don't really understand what my motive was back then, maybe giving back to the community or trying to pay God back for what he did for me. I don't know, but here's what happened. When I, when I spoke out my story, I received freedom. It's because if you hold a deep, dark secret inside you, it eats away at you, and it needs to be released so that you can receive freedom. It helped so much. Um, I also want to mention that um, I dealt, I had a real struggle with forgiving myself. That was huge. But um, I'm, I'm healed now, very thankful. The most healing came through reading the scriptures and prayer. I read in God's word how he feels about me, how he sees me, who I am in him, and it was absolutely life-changing. So, um, continuing on with our lives, we raised, sorry, to keep this mic right in front of me, we raised six children, and we have eight grandchildren, and I'm so thankful that I'm a mom. It's the greatest adventure ever, and um, I just love them all so much. I just want to mention that, because I do want you to know we have a big family now. So, in the past decade, I've had a strong desire to share the freedom I experienced with other women who've had abortions. I contacted CareNet. I enrolled in their post-abortion program. And my goal was to cover any gaps in my own personal healing journey. And I wanted to help other women, so of course I don't want to have any gaps. I met with a coach for 12 weeks. She was loving, understanding, and patient. I felt free to share my memories, my thoughts, and feelings with her. She prayed for me, she guided me through the curriculum. And during that time, I gave our baby a name, Joshua. I dreamt about him, and I wrote a letter to him too. These are all part of the process that brings healing. I knew Karenette was a safe place for women when I finished that curriculum, for women who have unexpected pregnancies, and also women who are hurting from abortion. So I'm now a volunteer care net. I'm very blessed to know these loving and dedicated women who sincerely love both the mother and the baby. Um, I came across this scripture this morning when I was reading my devotional, and it really, I thought it was so powerful for tonight. Isaiah chapter 45, verses 2 and 3. I will go before you, and I will level the mountains. I will break down gates of bronze and cut through bars of iron. I will give you treasures of darkness, riches stored in secret places, so that you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel, who summons you by name. 
It's an encouragement to know that we serve a God who will make the crooked places straight, the rough places smooth, and he will level the exalted places and the mountains. Having that kind of strength and power before us, behind us, and within us is a huge comfort. Whatever crooked, rough, or exalted places you may face, and I'm speaking to anyone here, and specifically to people that have been impacted by abortion. Whatever mountains are in your way, trust God. He will be the one to make your way straight, smooth, and level. I know from my life experience that Isaiah 61 verse 3 is true. He gives beauty for ashes, joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise for a spirit of despair. Thank you for listening to my story, and God bless all of you. worship song and you're welcome to join with us or just worship in your spirit. All right.
those are my friends. I've got here um, on vocals, Sarah McKelvey. On the piano, we have David McKay and Faith Eklund um, on harmony. Um, I don't know about y'all, but like, I really wish I could sing like that. And I know it gets auto-tuned by the time it gets to heaven. And so I've just decided that I know we shouldn't covet people's gifts. Um, but, you know, when I get to heaven, I'm first in line to get a better singing voice, for sure. Um, my name is Renee Rizzo, and I am so honored to get to speak here tonight. This subject, um, oh my gosh. Um, this subject is so important for us. Um, I'm going to give you kind of like a three-point sermon. Um, but first, I want to say um, I'm so glad that we started the night with a post-abortion story. Um, we have to recognize, just to give you the enormity of how much abortion affects all of us. Based on the number of the people in the room, would everybody in the first 10 tables stand up? Everybody, if you're numbered one through 10, stand up. In about a size, this room of people, this is how many people have suffered from an abortion. Take a, lot, a room, okay, even in a Christian setting, 58% of people who have an abortion claim to be either um, Protestant, Evangelical, or Catholic. You can sit down. Um, I just wanted you to feel that. So the thing I hope, and Jeanette's story, thank you so much. Y'all, she slayed it um, because it is not an easy thing to talk about, especially when the world is so strong in this conversation. And so I know and I hope that if you are sitting here tonight, like she said, I want you to know that you are loved, you are valued, um, that there is redemption for your story. So while I might speak the truth in love tonight, there is nothing that you have done that will separate you from the love of God. And so please, all those pastors that stood up er earlier, I'm sure any single one of them would be available for you to talk to at any point in this night. If, if something inside of you stirs up and says, I need to step away and I need to get some help, I want you to know that help is always there for you. Um, the sweet thing about being able to speak tonight is I arrived, I actually ran a pregnancy center for nearly 20 years in Nashville, Tennessee, and when I arrived in Nashville, um, the Lord had directed me um, in this journey coming down here, and all I knew was I was going to help broken people find hope, and I didn't even know what that was going to mean. I thought I was going to be like a, a shorter, Beth Moore, less hair, kind of funny, snarky. Um, but the Lord decided I was going to run a pregnancy center. I had never been pregnant. I had never had an abortion. Never even knew pregnancy centers existed till I got here. And the first two people that landed on my doorstep to nurture me was Chris and Margaret. And everybody else in the community kind of blackballed me because I didn't have like an amazing pastor. And so thank you, Margaret. And the fact that I'm now getting to coach her. So I stepped down a year ago so that I could get out um, and talk about this more nationally. Um, and so the fact that I get to coach with her once a month and be able to do this, it's such an honor and a, and a privilege. And I hope I do it justice. Here's the thing, y'all. We know Roe v. Wade went down, right? And we, and we are one of the 13 states where abortion is illegal. So we're done, right? No, we're not done. In fact, so much has happened in the last six months. I hope whether this is your first time here or you're like, 27th time here that I put a fire in your belly because y'all like I am righteously angry right now like there's so much that is coming against our, our conversation. The other side is angry, and they are not going to go down without a fight, and it's an evil fight, and it's an unfair fight, and the things that they're saying and, the, and doing is impacting your kids. They're impacting your congregation. It is infiltrated everywhere. So what I wanna do really quickly tonight is just tell you what the lay of the land looks like. I wanna tell you why pregnancy centers need to be at the forefront of this conversation more than ever before. And then I'm gonna challenge you to what you all need to do by the time you walk out of here and what you need to go going forward because our loudest megaphone needs to be the work that we're doing. We all need to be the hands and the feet of Christ. We cannot be doing this on our keyboard on social media. We have to be doing this lovingly and kindly. So the first thing I want to update you, because you may not know this, this is something that we live and breathe all of the time. And so I didn't know this when I wasn't involved in this world. So I'm going to give you just an update on the statistics of what's going on with abortion. Even before Roe v. Wade, there were 43 states 
that had some restrictions, and so typically abortions weren't done in the third trimester. Seven states allow third trimester abortions. Those seven states are still shouting that they, they can do that. And so I'm pretty sure y'all can figure that out. You can go get that. And also to make sure that you know that I'm not fluffing my numbers, I'm a data junkie, so I don't quote numbers that aren't legit. Um, one of the best places that you can get, although I hate going there, is Guttmacher Institute because it is definitely leaning against a conservative conversation, but their data is bar none on the accuracy of what they have to say about the law and the abortion rates um, in this land. So I'm getting the information from them. So I want you to know that that's where it's coming from. So 13 states have now, you know, banned abortion, and obviously Tennessee is one of them. Interestingly, when you go to the website in their map, they have a lay of the land map, there's a bunch of states, like 20 of them, that are marked yellow saying that it's very restrictive. So let's, let's hear what the world thinks is a very restrictive stance on abortion, that they need to have a 72-hour waiting period, and oh my goodness, they won't allow abortions after 24 weeks that's considered restrictive. And I don't know about you, but if you have not, I mean, and I would not recommend this easily and softly, but if you have not seen the movie Unplanned or Eric Metaxas just came out with a video, it's called The Procedure. It is not easy to watch, but it lets you know what a second trimester abortion looks like. So Renee, well, how often does that happen? In the United States, about 25 abortions happen every single day. 2,500, 90% of those are in the first trimester. 9% are in the second trimester. That's about 225 a day. So when I think of that horrific version of a, 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 second, term, a second term abortion, 225 a day, and then 25 a day in a third trimester. I already told you about the fact that 60% of them have a faith component. 70% of women who are considering an abortion already have a child at home. So this belief that we just need her to see the ultrasound and she's gonna see that it's a baby, she knows it's a baby. She's got one at home. So she already knows that. Um, so that's one of the facts that I want to, let me make sure I get all my numbers in here. Cause, oh yes. Um, and I already told you that in my age group, so I'm a lot older than some of the people in the room, um, one in three women in my age group have had an abortion. In the, like, the 25-year-old and younger age group, it's one in four. That's why, and so what I had you stand up was the one in four, which is the younger age population. So given the age demographic of some of y'all in the room with me, we might be closer to the one in three. So that just lets you know how much abortion permeates this entire country and into this entire world. Now you might be thinking, well, this is Dixon. It's not happening here. Everybody's doing well. So we had our marketing person do an analysis of Google searches for the last 12 months from June of 2021 to June of 2022. So even before the law changed, there were over 1,500 searches on average a month for abortion services in this community. So think Dixon, Fairview, and surrounding, 1,500 a month. That's how much our kids are looking for information about an abortion. And we know our call volume is not that high. So we need to bridge that gap. We need to make sure those kids know to call us. The other thing you may not know is that 50% of all of the abortions that happen today, over 50% are done with the abortion pill, which is actually two pills, and it does force a miscarriage at home. Here's what I find so fascinating. The other side would say, we don't care about women, we're worried that they're all gonna die from a miscarriage or an ectopic pregnancy. Here's the problem with an abortion pill that you can now get over the internet without an actual live visit you can't guarantee that she is under 10 weeks because a safe, and I say that loosely, um, abortion pill procedure, she needs to be under 10 weeks. So if she's taken that abortion pill past 10 weeks or if she has an ectopic pregnancy, she can bleed out at home. And yet we're the population that doesn't want that, or that wants that to happen. So I think you need to realize that. So you might go, well, Renee, how many abortions of those 2,500 are happening because of that? 
Here's the thing, 67% of women who have an abortion say they're having an abortion because they don't have resources. And so when we talk about a place like Karenet, who's got the resources, y'all, even if the law didn't change, we could wipe out 67% of that 2,500. That's pretty amazing. Less than 2% of all abortions are because of rape, incest, and life of the mom. Now, those 2% women, if I'm in that 2%, that's, I matter, you matter, right? So I'm not saying 2% isn't an important number. And I feel like that is a tragic story, um, but it is not why we have an abortion problem in our country. And we know that. And so this is, but this is the narrative. And so then I kind of want to segue to what is the narrative? So the narrative is um, a pro-life conservative approach to this model. And I'm not saying political, you guys, I'm the least political person. I'm talking about just this approach and this conversation um, that we're having here. But the media has now linked arms with the politicians, has linked arm with the abortion industry, and has linked arms with Big Pharma. And everywhere you watch on television and in the news, everybody is talking about how safe the abortion pill is. It is like Tylenol. I have seen no less than seven shows, like I mean Law and Order, uh, Station 19, Grey's Anatomy, Chicago Medical, last, the other night, New Amsterdam, Every medical and legal and firefighter show is having a story in the last six months, and they're either promoting how safe an abortion pill is, and you think, you guys, when they keep saying it's just like Tylenol, you don't think Tylenol isn't part of the conversation there? Because as far as I know, they wouldn't be letting them use their name without some kickback. They're not saying aspirin. They're given a brand name. And so we already know there's a partnership there. And y'all then, just, just this week, one of my favorite shows, New Amsterdam, the opening scene is everybody getting a text message. And everybody, and it goes from one cast member to the next. And all I'm thinking is, oh God, someone else died on the show. Someone else died on the show. And it was everybody reacting to Roe v. Wade going down. And the entire episode was about how we need to do everything possible to change that and offer abortions to everybody. And in all of these shows that I'm watching, you guys, do you ever think the person who wants to have their baby, who is pro-life, is ever shown as a kind person, an intelligent person? Even in the show, this woman is five or six months pregnant and they fi she finds out she has cancer. And so they want to terminate the pregnancy so she can start chemo. And she's like, can't do it. She goes, I was one of the people celebrating that Roe went down. And they're like, but it's your life. And they basically shame her for the rest of the episode that she's going to choose to walk this pregnancy out. So I'm not saying this to you guys to like, I, again, I, I'm hoping to like go, oh, gosh, that is just, that's what your kids are seeing. Because if that's what they're seeing, then that's going to make them think this conversation is okay. And they're never going to pick up the phone and call CareNet, especially if we aren't talking about it. The other thing that you know is coming with Big Pharma, Big Pharma is already talking to the FDA about having the abortion pill reclassified as just birth control. So, y'all, that's where we're going. So it's not even going to end there. The other thing that they're doing is, and y'all, if y'all don't know it, they are, the media is slaughtering pregnancy centers. Pregnancy centers, Elizabeth Warren was one of the first people to come out and call us fake pregnancies. We're fake medical clinics. Um, and so first we were fake because we don't provide um, abortion. Um, and then we don't follow OSHA and HIPAA. Um, and then this was going wrong. And so pregnancy centers around the country and in this state are being vandalized. They're getting hate mail. So we have staff receiving hate mail. We have people going on social media and putting out negative posts about us. Google has joined the party. And so now Google is fighting, pushing down us um, pregnancy centers on the search engines. Um, and when you're going like a pregnancy center, we're lucky if we can spend $3,000 a month in advertising. And we're going up against million dollar a month budgets. And so they're doing everything they can so clients and women and men don't find us 
when they search for us. And then when they do search for us on the Yelp review and the Google reviews now, it's got this little thing in writing that says, they may not have medical doctors on site. This may not be a real medical clinic. So I want you to see the enormity of what is being said about that. On top of that, and by the way, I promise you, if any pregnancy center wasn't following OSHA and HIPAA, y'all, we'd be shut down. Um, and I know this because at Hope Clinic, like five years ago, we were getting rid of something in the ceiling and somebody sent an anonymous, we were, the builder was following protocol, blah, blah, and somebody sent an anonymous tip to Tosha. And within 48 hours, they did a site visit. It was this long drawn out thing. The building was fine. It was safe. But I'm just telling you, that's how fast OSHA and HIPAA gets in the conversation. So I promise you, I have tried to search across the internet. I have not seen one pregnancy center shut down in the nearly 40 years that they have existed because of an OSHA or HIPAA violation. And yet, like we have eight senators signing documents trying to get all of us shut down because of that. And then somebody else sent a link, and I'm actually gonna read this because I don't wanna screw this up. This is now on the website of the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. So a platform who should be pretty neutral, yes? Yes, okay. So they even have a section called Crisis Pregnancy Center Information and Resources. As access to abortion continues to become increasingly restrictive around the country, it's critical that people know where to turn for comprehensive reproductive health, pregnancy counseling, and abortion care. Information on how to identify legitimate health care is especially important now as crisis pregnancy centers, which uses misinformation and manipulation to delay people in finding abortion care until their pregnancies have progressed past the legit time for abortion, becoming more and more commonplace. To learn about crisis pregnancy centers and the danger they pose to pregnant people, we recommend you seeing our latest issue. And then they even have a flow chart on how to make sure that when you're on the phone, you don't find a pregnancy center. Y'all, OBGYNs are doing this. And here's the, so I did some research. How many OBGYNs actually do abortion services? Technically, it's about one in five. One in five OBGYNs can do an abortion, but statistically by surveys, only 7% of OBGYNs will actually perform an abortion. So if they're not even willing to do it, how could they be talking so negatively about pregnancy centers? So I just, I found that just very, very interesting. So before I go on, I just feel like words matter. Do y'all believe that words matter? And so I wanted to replace the negative words that have come against um, pregnancy centers. So my dear friend Brenda here, God has gifted her with some prophetic words, and so she has given positive words in environments in front of police officers, firemen, and military, where the world has started to say some really negative stuff, and she's replacing it from the Word of God. And so she's going to read it. It's out in a picture that's going to be hung at the clinic as a gift, and so I'm going to let you share it, because it is our marking in the sand tonight that the word of God is bigger than the word of the world right now. Chosen. Humanity claimed above firmament's glory. Imagine the love of our majestic creator. Sovereignly woven, threaded in his image. Fearfully, wonderfully, lovingly we are adored. Chosen we stand. Chosen by love. Shattered pieces of a distraught soul, pierced in heart, hardened by his resolve. Lament nights, gripped by his grief, toxic shame, iniquity's blight. Chosen we stand, chosen by love. Powerful are the winds of an agape love. Redemption, a legacy we all want to know. Conquering every fiery flame with melodies of his word. Chosen we stand, chosen by love. Purpose the hand to the fallen one. Rescue and prosper upon pastures of no hope. Life in covenant to thy father's will. Seeds of love, yet will we remember? 
Chosen we stand, chosen by love. Fragrant love, splendors of a forgotten valley, desolate strain, searching for love's reserve. Taunted by burdens, hindered in pain, rekindled love, inspirations of grace. Chosen we stand, chosen by love. Yet this day as we stand chosen by love, labored in decision to extend the same love, Miraculous is the healing, the love of a lamb slain for his innocent blood. Choose love. Mm. Thank you. Oh, beautiful. So that's like the perfect segue because I just talked about all this like negative stuff, right? And what is the beacon of light in this negative stuff? It is places like CareNet. There are 4,000 pregnancy centers across this country. We actually outnumber abortion clinics 30 to 1. I mean, so there's so many more of us doing God's work um, and really meeting the needs of the women. And here's what I love about um, pregnancy centers. They are the very hands and feet of Christ. I mean... Um, the two ladies before us already kind of described it so perfectly. And I kind of look at pregnancy centers helping the tangible and then the intangible. The tangible is all the stuff that you heard about. It's the pregnancy test, the ultrasounds, the counseling, the mentoring, the education classes online, the education classes on site, the store to be able to get stuff, the stuff. You guys, if clients go through these programs, they, they really don't have to buy anything. And here's the beautiful thing. It's not like at a pregnancy center we ever say our time is up with you. It could, our relationship could last about a year. It could last two years. And if our relationship is done, we know who to send them to next. It's not like we just go, oh, we're done with you. So here's the other thing. When people say that we are only pro-birth or pro-baby in the womb, Everything we do says otherwise. And in fact, the irony is I don't know one abortion clinic that provides aftercare after the abortion. They won't even provide a follow-up visit after the abortion pill to make sure that everything's happened the way it's supposed to happen. So they don't offer pregnancy care. They don't offer um, any kind of counseling, and they don't offer any follow-up medical care. Pregnancy centers do. They will walk with them in that journey. But here's the thing. That's just like putting the oxygen mask. And it's kind of like a workout. You know how like we all think if you just run, 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 you're going to lose weight. And you will because you will burn calories while you're working out. But now we know that there's so much value in strength training. Because if you build muscle, you will burn calories while you're sleeping. And I would say that is the beauty of what pregnancy centers do. It's that intangible gift. It is reminding them that they are valued, loved, affirmed. It is rebuilding their soul. It is helping them find redemption and purpose because the gifts that they plant inside the clients will last for years to come. That's the difference with a pregnancy center, is that we're not going to just do the tangible stuff, but we're also going to do the supernatural stuff, the stuff that only we can do. And it is so, so important. So we need CareNet. We need them more than ever. And here's the thing. I'm actually a little worried in some ways that an abortion clinic doesn't exist because it, you know, we were in my clinic, we were a few miles away. There were about six abortion clinics in the state. And there were a lot of people praying at abortion clinics that could intercept clients to get them to places like us. So here's what's happening. That 1,500 people that are searching every single month for abortions, they're not going to a brick and mortar in Tennessee. They're leaving the state. And so we have got to find a way to make sure that we can get to them. And that is where you kind of come in tonight. Because um, the, one of the things that I've talked about with Margaret is pregnancy centers across the country need to grow in two years, in two ways. The biggest is that we need to grow in prevention. We need to make sure that our community and our young adults and our teens know that pregnancy centers exist before they've even started dating before they've even had those relationships. They need to see them as a beacon of education and resource so that when they, if they do find themselves in a difficult situation, 
they're going to think to call CareNet or they're going to talk to you because they've learned from you that you're a safe person to go to and you're going to get them to CareNet. So we need to be talking to them at the prevention level. The second thing that we're going to need to do is advertise really differently. We cannot go up against with Google ads anymore. We cannot rely on search engines anymore. And so um, I've had Margaret um, starting in January, they're going to be partnering with the same um, advertising company that um, my center was using and the two other big centers in Tennessee were using because we have been really strategic about how do we go after finding women, especially abortion vulnerable women, before they leave the state. And I don't know if you've seen it in the news, but they're already now doing mobile abortion buses at the state border all around the state. And so we have to make sure. Um, and so there's three main areas of increased funding that we're going to have you help us do. One, we need more staff. Um, we need more staff to handle this volume. I mean, when Margaret tells me how much she does, it, it reminds me why I stepped down from running a nonprofit for 20 years. Um, and so that team, we need more staff to do some development and outreach. We need more staff handling the client care, the classes and the mentorship. Because again, you guys, it's so easy for a pregnancy center to get so big that the numbers, we can't keep up with them. We don't even know if we're talking to 20% of them. And that's not true here at CareNet. Y'all know what's going on with your clients and I don't want that to change. And then of course, to handle the volume and the need, we need to update some of the rooms and so there's some property expansion. So that's kind of like the three main areas. It's staffing for clients, staffing for development and outreach, and um, some property. And so I have a dollar goal for tonight that is bigger than the one she told me because, you know, I could be more bold because it's not my center anymore. So this is the last part. This is like, where can you get involved? So if you're listening to me, and by the way, I forgot to say hi, mom. Mom is watching from Connecticut. She never gets to see me talk. And so I'm grateful that we got to live stream for mom. Um, so education, we have a lot of churches in the room. We have people who own businesses in the room and we have individuals. So when we talked about prevention, I need to tell you, we need to be talking not, we need to be talking about sex and relationships and consent and boundaries. And please let um, Margaret and Matthew, who's the board chair, he's here somewhere, or not the board chair, he's the something, he's the treasurer. Anyway, he told me he's the sex expert. No, I mean, I'm not saying that, I'm kidding. <laughs> but. And now you're thinking, well, we already talk about prevention. We don't need outside people to come talk to you about it. I used to think that too, you guys. I was a cheerleading coach and I thought I knew everything and my girls would show up at camp and these cute little cheerleaders would come out and they would say the same stinking thing I've been saying all year. And all of a sudden my girls just go, oh my gosh, did you hear what they said? And I'm like, yes, I've been saying that. So sometimes having outside um, people who aren't connected say the same thing. Somehow it sticks. Let your ego go. It works. It just really does. And you also need to let us come talk to the women. Like, do you know how many Jeanettes are out there that are holding on to their abortion story because they don't have a safe place to talk about it? Because if you were brave enough to talk about abortion, you did it in a way that might make her feel like there's no way. I can talk about my abortion. So please have this conversation. Let the team kind of come out and talk to you about that. Um, families, if you are um, homeschooling or you don't go to a church that's gonna talk about it, get a bunch of you together and call Margaret and the team to come out. She can come talk to the parents. See, that when you've been in this industry long enough, we're not afraid to talk about this stuff. Like our filter is really low. And so like if your teenagers ask you in questions that embarrass you, we can handle it. So have us come do it. Like I'm Aunt Renee, my nieces and nephew come ask me all the hard questions and, my, and their parents get very embarrassed by my answers but I'm a speak the truth and love girl. So please let your families kind of come out there and do it. If you're a business owner, have a lunch and learn. Now, you also might be feeling like, gosh, Renee, you just like vomited a lot of data on me and like I lost you like 10 minutes ago. I'm really proud that my home church, One Church Home out in Fairview, thank you, I know, 
Um, we've got Pastor Shane with us here today, and him and I co-hosted like five episodes on this topic of abortion. So if you go to the YouTube channel of One Church Home and you go to Homeroom, you'll feel, see a five-part series that we did on abortion. And it is so, it's got just jam-packed full of good information. So if anything I said made you want to learn more, please go check it out and share that because um, when we speak the truth in love, we can get a lot farther. I want you to raise awareness. Remember I just told you, Google and Yelp and everybody's going to stop our, our conversation. Um, we want to make sure word gets out about this. And word of mouth is still the number one way girls find their way into our centers. And here's the thing. Here's the other reason why all that fake news stuff is just wrong. Y'all, word of mouth is loud. If we are happy about an experience, we might tell people. If we are unhappy about ex an experience, we tell 11 to 15 people. If pregnancy centers were doing misinformation, shaming, blaming, and harming women, word would get out. They would stop coming, and that's not true. Okay, and then of course we need your money. Yes, we need your money. I think it's such a privilege to get to ask you. Here's the thing, pregnancy centers are not federally funded. Even when, when Donald Trump stopped funding from Planned Parenthood, everyone was like, great, all the money's gonna go to the pregnancy centers. We did not see a dime. It all went to health departments, fine, but it didn't come to us. And then lately in the news, oh, the governor, he's so awful, he helped get pregnancy centers to get an ultrasound. So he helped pregnancy centers get medical equipment. That's it. That's really the only place you're going to see pregnancy centers get money. And so it is up to you and I to do that. When, we use, when I think about this phrase, choose love, if you're married, if you're a parent, you know love is a sacrifice, right? You know love is a choice. If we want clients to choose life, we have to choose love, which means it has to be a sacrifice for us. So if it's a sacrifice for your time, talents, and treasures, now is your chance to step up to the plate. So I am going to walk you through this lovely pledge card. I think I got to everything. I'm bad at looking at my notes, so I'm a big believer of I said what I was supposed to say, and I forget what I'm supposed to forget. So we have these handy-dandy partnership. I like to call them partnership cards, right? And because it's a way for you to partner with us. And so I hope you heard some amazing things about what CareNet does specifically, amazing ways for you to get involved. I've hoped I scared you or angered you enough with me just a little bit to want to do something about it because you guys in the Christian community, we just can't start flipping tables. We'd like to, but we can't. And this is the most tangible way that you can sacrificially love your community. So there is an opportunity to fill out the pledge card. If you don't like writing your credit card information, you can use this fancy QR code now with your phone to kind of do that. If you're like, oh my gosh, Renee, you all moved me to give twice as much money as I thought, but I don't have that check with me. I need to get paid or wait for my Christmas bonus. You can make it a pledge. So I guess our only goal is that you try to pay off that pledge, ideally before December 31st, 11.59 p.m., <laughs> right? Um, and so my goal for tonight is $150,000. I know, it's nothing. Y'all can do it. If you divide it by the number of people here, y'all can do it. And so I just need you to stretch. If you are a church, a business, a person in this room, and here's the thing, y'all, we had a great meal. Did we not agree we had a great meal? Yes, yes, we had a great meal. We've had some great music, and you're going to get one more great song. So I don't know, maybe you thought, nah, at least write out a check for five bucks. I mean, I don't know. The word, dinner was worth at least 30, in my opinion. But like, I always have this goal. I want a gala. I want to walk away from a gala where everybody gave something. I don't care if you give two pennies. Like, seriously, I think there's something about this entire room saying, yeah, I'm all in. Here's my year pledge, or eh. I'm not sure, but here's something. I don't care what your gift is, God will multiply and do amazing things with it. So while you're praying about it, um, the team is gonna sing one more song. No, is that right? Yes, that's right. And then somebody else, though, so the mate that you should have a thing on your ink, there is a white envelope that the table house had that's gonna collect them. And then the person closing in prayer is gonna tell us what to do with them. Anything else I'm missing? Good. Okay. Hopefully we're ready to sing. Rock it, girl.
Thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, as you begin to clear out, um, oh, I'm going to tell him about Matthew. Yes. And he's going to close this in prayer. All right. Um, I'll also go ahead and tell you, take the care net pen with you. It's my favorite. Margaret sneaks me another one every time I come. Take it. It's a great conversation piece, and they're honestly the best pens. Um, Matthew Hyatt is our treasurer and no sex expert. And so... <laughs> What she means is that he and Margaret teach the abstinence courses and are available to come and talk to your teenagers and answer their questions. But I'll never pass up an opportunity to give him a hard time. So, Matt, if you'll close this in prayer, and then he, as our treasurer, will collect your envelopes from your table host. I have never been more glad that my wife didn't join me for an event than I am tonight. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. I echo everything Danny said, Renee said. My favorite part of tonight, she said, if we want to choose life, we have to choose love. And that's a simple uh, but not easy challenge for us. So thank you for partnering with us to do that. Please do bring these up to us when you're finished. Drive home safely. Let's be dismissed with a prayer. Father, we thank you for a good night, and we thank you for the good work you have given us to do. Thank you for the reminder that our work is not over, and thank you for 
promising to work with us and through us and for us with tools and resources more powerful than anything we could bring ourselves. Bless us tonight. Bless CareNet. Help us make a difference for your kingdom that lasts for all eternity. Through Christ we pray. Amen.